Hi, thank you for joining us for our weekly little online uh, service from Christ Church St. James Etobicoke, that's kind of West Toronto. I'm delighted you're with us for a very simple time each week. We, we pray, we worship, and we um, listen. Um, not so much to me, I hope, but to what the Bible is saying to us about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what Jesus would like to do in your life and mine if we just um, made that priority in our lives. So we've been doing that by walking through the Gospel of Mark for quite some time now, and today we'll be in the 12th chapter again of the Gospel of Mark, just taking a look at something about Jesus that speaks to where we are at in life. Let's just begin by having a word of prayer together. I'm just reminded that the Lord is in his holy temple and we're invited to keep silence before him and to seek him while he may be found and to call upon him while he's close. And the invitation to actually worship the Lord uh, in spirit and in truth. Um, so Jesus, we we're asking you now to please, I ask you please now to help all of my uh, friends who are watching at this time to be aware that you love them and you're with them and this time is a pretty special one because you're right in it we give it all to you in Jesus name Amen <laughs> song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will trust in you alone and I and I will Upon your love, it is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Holy, there is none beside you, there is no one like you. 
Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Yeah, it's a wonderful way to pray. And um, ultimately, that is why we have this little uh, service each week, because the longing of our hearts is that everyone who takes a moment to be with us will just consider or reconsider Jesus and where you're at in life and what you're, you would like your life to be about. It goes so quickly, and we don't want to waste it. So that's why we just want to encourage people to consider life, consider Christ, and what, what the connection might be. That's all. Not forcing, not making, not demanding, just asking. That's simple as that. So, Mark chapter 12, we're going to be looking at um, the last little section today, verse 34b, until the very end. It's not very long. But basically, as we press on in this very fast-moving biography of Jesus, we'll see in this last, last section kind of three scenes that we're we're drawn into. So let's just begin. Scene one. What's been going on? Jesus has been on the receiving end. He's been on the firing line, if you like, for quite some time. Um, people have been asking him all kinds of questions for quite some time, but they haven't been asking him questions so they could understand, so they could learn. No, they've been asking questions in hope of trying to find some way to trip, trick him, and to trap him so they could try him <laughs> and find him guilty of some crime. I mean, they wanted the powers that be to see Jesus as dangerous and have him reined in, to say the very least. So how has Jesus responded to all of this? Well, he has been steady. Uh, he stood tall as he's faced opposition. And the result of that, let's just listen, what happens as a result of Jesus answering all their questions in ways that just blew their minds? Verse 34b, after this, nobody dared to ask Jesus any more questions. Yeah. I mean, they've raised all their objections. They've raised all their fears and concerns about Jesus. And now they're taking a breath. And now it's time to let Jesus do the talking, which is really wise. It doesn't mean for you and me right away that we have to agree with everything that Jesus says. But at least we give Jesus the space to speak. I mean, to teach and to help us look again at the issues. I mean, why would anyone jump into an argument or a debate if, if we haven't taken the time to appreciate or understand what it is exactly we are opposing. Having a strong opinion on something is fine. And we're not supposed to, even here, we're not supposed to check our brains at the door when we walk in a place like this or into a Bible study group. I mean, integrity demands much more from us than that. But we are invited to listen. In fact, we read things like, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We're told, let the wise also hear and gain understanding. I just was thinking about, as an 18-year-old kid a million years ago, um, just full of angst and full of reasons not to believe the way people believed uh, in Jesus. And I would go to a gentle old pastor, and he just let me rant. And uh, once I poured out all the reasons why I thought I was right and he was wrong, um, once I thought that I'd proved my point, he would then ask permission to respond. And I would take a breath and sit back and give him a moment to prove me wrong. What an arrogant young guy I was. And often I'd bring a book and I'd want him to read my point of view in this book. And then he would kindly take that book from me. And then he would offer me one of his own books to read. And uh, 
Well, the day came when I quit bringing books, put it that way. And I quit looking for reasons to resist the truth. And the day came when I just came to listen. And I'm, I'll, ever, I'll always be indebted to that gentleman who was so patient with me and allowed me to say what I had to say, but then gave me time just to listen. There is wisdom in listening, in taking time for serious study, as opposed to solely reacting based on our own gut reaction or our bias. So we make the soundest decisions, right? When we've truly taken the time to investigate the issue from all kinds of angles. But there are those in this story, <laughs> the men in the story, they didn't do that. Um, for them it was, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. And we see them now. Um, they've given up their attempts to try to trap Jesus with questions. And now they're gonna retreat to go and create trumped up charges against Jesus. And that's how scene one ends. But in the meantime, how does scene two begin? Well, look at this, verse 35. As Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked the question, how can the teachers of the law say the Messiah will be a descendant of David? The Holy Spirit inspired David to say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right side until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself called him Lord. So how can the Messiah be David's descendant? This all sounds kind of confusing. But it's Jesus' turn to ask questions. So there he is in the temple courts again, surrounded by people who are really eager to hear him. What a delight that must have been. And he raises the most important question, really. And the most important question is, really, what do you think about Christ? What's your understanding of the Messiah? I mean, this is a far more important question, by the way, than any of the religious leaders have been thrown at him. And the reason it's so important is this, because our understanding of who the Christ is, the Messiah is, will determine which way we go in life. I mean, if we are wrong about Jesus, if we get Jesus wrong, we miss the boat. It'd be difficult for me to exaggerate how important it is to get this right. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said something like, if Christianity is false, it's of no importance. If it's true, it's of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. I, I like that quote. So Jesus knows this is important. And he quotes from a psalm, Psalm 110, that was written by David. And he asked his listeners to explain how David's son, as in King David, could also be David's Lord. Hang, hang in there with me for just a moment. Here's the background. The Jews believed that the Christ, the Messiah, would be a descendant of King David. They also believed that only the Messiah could sit on the right-hand side of God. And so Jesus says, if the Messiah is David's son, born from David's line, how can he also be David's Lord? And of course, there's only one answer to that question. I mean, as a man, the Messiah is David's son, David's descendant. But as God, the Messiah is David's Lord. So Psalm 110 is teaching the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. He is David's Lord and David's son. And scholars at the time when Jesus was speaking, they were confused about the Messiah. I mean, they knew the scripture spoke of the Messiah as a conquering king, but they also knew the scripture spoke of the Messiah as a suffering servant. How could, how could this be? How could the Messiah die and also reign? So what's going on here, Jesus, he's trying to help people see the answer is actually standing right in front of them. He, in fact, is the one they've been looking for and longing for all these years. But again, what do the Pharisees do? They close 
their eyes. They choose to close their eyes and turn away from the answer. As many people do today. I mean, when we listen to people objecting or even mocking the message of Jesus, and even on these little videos, we get a fair share of people wanting to mock. We try to appreciate what's behind all that. And three different possibilities come to my mind. Why is a person reacting the way they are? And sometimes I would say it's an emotional barrier. And I totally respect it. In other words, someone has a painful memory from a bad church experience or perhaps a harmful encounter with someone who said they were Christian. And because of that painful memory, then they can't hear the message. There's too much hurt. The wounds are too deep. It brings back too many hurtful recollections. So is this the reason the person is objecting to what they're hearing, to the invitation of Jesus because of past abuse? And if it is, we get it. And we understand it. And we ache for that person. I mean, loads of people have been hurt by church. There's no denying that. But what we ask someone to do is this, please, if you can, I know it's not easy always, please remember there is a distinction between church and God, a huge distinction. In Jesus' day, those who wounded, those who sought to control people were often the religious leaders. And Jesus reserved his strongest warnings for those who misused their positions of leadership and harmed other people. So if it helps at all, please know that if you have been hurt or had a bad church experience, Jesus actually stands on your side. He's with you. And even though we are far from perfect and of all kinds of flaws, we would like to stand on your side too. I'm just sharing that. So an emotional barrier, I totally respect it. For sometimes the people struggle with the invitation of Jesus because of an intellectual barrier. And again, I appreciate this. I mean, is the reason someone is saying no and even getting to the place of mocking perhaps or objecting strongly to the gospel is because they've asked answers that haven't been adequately addressed or the only answer they got back was more fluff than fact. I mean, if so, that should cause a person to explore the matter all the more. Because the evidence actually is there to be examined. It's all around us. And we can either examine it defensively and miss the point and miss the truth. Or we can examine it humbly and honestly and meet the truth. And that's why uh, books are really helpful if we're serious. I remember how much I appreciated Know What You Believe. Another one was called Know Why You Believe. Another one was called Know Who You Believe. Um, I really appreciated that years ago, and I've, I've gone through it a number of times since. I appreciated this one. Um, did the resurrection happen? Um, I mean, if it didn't, let's go get an honest job. But if it did, let's get serious. So that was really worth reading. And years ago, um, there was a gentleman who was so against Christianity. He was a university student that he just wanted to prove how foolish it all was. So he made a real in-depth study, historically, archaeologically, prophetically. He, he just, to prove that everything he was hearing about Jesus was just a lie. Well, in the process, he discovered there was just too much evidence it demanded a verdict. His name was Josh McDowell. In fact, he went on to write another book simply called More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And um, so it does the mind good to look at the historical and archaeological and, and prophetic evidence concerning the scriptures and most importantly concerning the resurrection of Jesus. It's really well worth the study. As many former atheists like Josh McDowell, and many people today in positions of influence, scientific influence, would tell us our faith is actually rooted in fact, 
not in fable. So there's this emotional barrier sometimes, an intellectual barrier. I respect them both. But the third barrier that comes to mind is a little more difficult, and that's a volitional barrier. And basically, a, a volitional barrier says, it's not that I can't believe. I won't believe. I won't believe no matter how much proof there is, no matter how much evidence there is. I'm just, my mind's made up, forget it, leave me alone. And that well describes the Pharisees' attitude toward Jesus. I mean, they, they knew the truth, <laughs> but they pretended they didn't. It was an inconvenient truth. It's one they rather wasn't real. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Jesus, a large crowd was listening to Jesus gladly. And as he taught them, he said, watch out for the teachers of the law who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace and who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best place at the feast. They take advantage of widows and they rob them of their homes and they make a show of saying long prayers and their punishment will be all the worse. My, oh my. This is Jesus speaking about those people I was just making reference to, the Pharisees. He says, beware of them. Why? He tells us why. Because, A, they like to parade around, all dressed up, and uh, receive respectful greetings. They love attention. They delight in being called rabbi, which can be translated, my great one. Interesting, eh? And they love the, the seats, in the, the, the best seats in the synagogue and the, the head table at the banquet. They, they want to be in the spotlight all the time. Uh, they take advantage, financial advantage, of people, specifically widows. And when I read that, I thought, oh, it's the equivalent, is it not, of the religious charlatans of our day who play and prey upon others to support them, to help them maintain their extravagant lifestyles. That should do something to us. And Jesus says, beware of them because they pretend to be pious. <laughs> making these long prayers, but they're not praying to God. They're just showing off. They're just showing off. And Jesus warns against them. And I appreciate why he's warning. He says he's warning against them because there are no big shots in the kingdom of God. There are no big shots. The ground level is the very same in the kingdom of God. A servant is not above his master, Jesus says. Paul says, don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. We're to, we're to learn to be a servant of all. That's the invitation. And it's not about trying to impress other people about how religious you are, mercy. It's always about the audience of one. And that takes us to the final scene, the audience of one. As Jesus sat near the table, treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. And many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. Jesus called the disciples together and said to them, I tell you, this poor widow, she put in more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare of their riches. But she, poor as she is, put in all she had, all she had to live on. I mean, talk about a study in contrast here. I mean, Jesus has just come down heavy on religious abuse, all the pomp and show that goes along with us sometimes. And in walks this dear lady, a widow, poor, yet rich in faith, quietly making her offering to the audience of one. Nobody else is noticing this lady, but Jesus notices this lady. I love that. And he sees her, and he sees the sacrifice that she's making. Yeah, those who were rich, well, they gave a lot more. But Jesus said in God's eco economy, this lady gave a lot more because her offering was a genuine sacrifice. She only had two coins, she gave them both. So God measures giving not by what we give, but by what we keep for ourselves. And she kept back nothing. So <laughs> three scenes that really speak to us in a variety of ways. I mean, I'll just throw some out at you as we, as we conclude. How we answer Jesus' question about his identity will have a huge impact 
on how we do life. Is he just a man? Or is he much more than a man? The big question is, is Jesus really who he says he is? If Jesus really is who he says he is, shouldn't I be following him? Shouldn't I be making him priority? Number two, what is holding me back? What barrier, if you like, is holding me back from taking that first step toward Jesus? Is it? Is my struggle an emotional one? Have I had some bad experiences? Is it intellectual one? I just can't figure this out. Or is it a volitional one? And I don't want to go there, no matter how true it is. Could that barrier become a hurdle? Thirdly, is there any way that I'm like those men Jesus talked about, those Pharisees? Is there any way I'm like those guys at all? Is my faith more of a show than of substance? And fourthly, concern that little lady, that widow. Have I quietly given my all to him? Not, not talking about money now. I'm talking about my life now. Am I living my life before the audience of one, the only one that really matters? Am I living to please God? We're going to leave it there. Um, no one can answer those questions for you. Only you can answer those questions for you. The ball is in your court and my court. Uh, what we do with those questions is up to you. I pray that we will take a moment to ask ourselves, could this be true? And if it is true, What's my next step? We just pray together. Father, thank you for this time and for that, how we all began about the song to build our lives upon you. And I would pray that for all those who are taking time with us now, just to make that our priority, to consider what it means to build our lives upon you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Until next time.